today, I will discuss about heparin induced thrombocytopenia, uh, which is a severe complication that occurs in patients exposed to any form of or amount of heparin products. Uh, this condition is usually characterized by a fall in platelet count and a hypercoagulable state. And this heparin induced thrombocytopenia can be classified into type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is more common, but type 2 is more clinically significant. So, in this presentation, we'll be focusing more on the type 2. Heat. So briefly talking about type 1 heat, uh, it is a non-immune mediated reaction and it's more common than type 2 and it can occur as early as day 1 of the therapy with heparin products. It's a mild reaction. It's not associated with any complications and platelet counts will spontaneously normalize even if heparin is continued and the more important is that this condition is not associated with any hypercoagulation unlike type 2 heat. So now moving on to the type 2 heat. It is an immune antibody mediated reaction and it occurs after 5 to 14 days of receiving heparin because it takes time for the antibodies to form. However, if a patient has been exposed to heparin within last 100 days, the antibodies may remain in the system causing this reaction to manifest as soon as day 1 of re-exposure to the heparin. This is a very serious reaction because it causes hypercoagulative state leading to the multiple uh, thrombosis in the various parts of the body and that is one of the common cause of mortality in this condition. So now talking about the epidemiology of this condition, it can occur in up to 5% of the patients exposed to the heparin product and uh, it causes an extremely hypercoagulable state. As 50% of the patients develop uh, thromboembolic complications and the mortality is up to 30%. And this condition is more common with unfractionated heparin then with low molecular weight heparin, uh, this fundaparinox, which is a pentasaccharide, doesn't cause heat and it can be used for the treatment of heat actually. The risk of heat increases with a higher dose of heparin, longer duration of use in female patients, in old patients, in those patients requiring surgical intervention. So now talking about the pathophysiology of this condition. This platelet factor 4 released by the platelet, when it combines with the heparin, this complex is formed. The platelet factor 4 heparin complex and this complex triggers the release of the immunoglobulin. This immunoglobulin then combines with the this platelet factor 4 heparin complex and when this complex binds to the FT receptor in the platelets, it leads to the activation of the platelet. So when the platelet is activated, it will release the microparticles, more PF4 factors as well as the procoagulants like the thrombin. So these activated platelets will lead to activation of the coagulation pathway as well as the aggregation of the platelets. So the end result of this process is severe hypercoagulable state due to activation of the coagulation pathway and thrombocytopenia occurs because the macrophages, they consume these uh, the platelets and the reticular endothelial cells will remove this platelet from the circulation. And simultaneously, when there is platelet aggregation, platelets get consumed. That also leads to the thrombocytopenia. So this is the mechanism of apparently induced thrombocytopenia. So when you examine the patient, you know, there could there can be the ecchymosis, petechi, or there can be rashes at the site of heparin sort or person can have the swelling of the arms, legs, which are the features of the arterial and venous thrombosis. So the, for the diagnosis, it's basically a clinical diagnosis. So we need to be very vigilant while, when we are treating any patients with heparin. And in addition to the our clinical suspicion, there is a 4T scoring system which can be used to determine the pretest probability of heparin induced thrombocytopenia. This is a very useful score you know, which helps in excluding the diagnosis of heat. However, it can result in overdiagnosis of heat in situations where thrombocytopenia and thrombosis due to the other etiologies are common, such as in the intensive care units. So this is the table showing the 4T scoring system. The 4Ts, they stand for thrombocytopenia, timing of onset, thrombosis, and the other causes of thrombocytopenia. So based on this uh, scoring system, we can calculate a score. And if the score is 0 to 3, it indicates low score, and it has very high negative predictive value. Whereas those with the intermediate or high score, they need to be evaluated further with the other tests. So other tests which can be used for the diagnosis include the platelet factor 4 heparin antibody test. Uh, it will detect the antibodies in the serum, but this test has very low specificity for the diagnosis of heat and it has a high negative predictive value and the next test which can be done is platelet activation assay the most common one is serotonin release assay and this test also has low sensitivity so basically the diagnosis of heat is clinical 
These are the common complications which can occur because of the heat. All the complications occur because of the hypercoagulable state. So patient can develop DVD, pulmonary embolism, peripheral arterial thrombosis, stroke, myocardial infarction, cerebral sinus thrombosis, splanchnic vein thrombosis, skin necrosis, and even sometimes can cause adrenal insufficiency due to thrombosis in the adrenal circulation. So the complications, they usually occur within the first 10 days of the disease. However, this prothrombotic state can persist up to 30 days after starting heparin. So treatment is basically cessation of the heparin. All forms of heparin products would be stopped and patients should be initiated on a therapeutic dose anticoagulation with an alternative agent. We need to start the anticoagulation even if the platelet is low because the risk of thrombosis because of this hypercoagulability is more than the risk of bleeding due to thrombocytopenia. So for the anticoagulation, direct thrombic inhibitors are the preferred agent. Ergotroban and the bivalirudin are FDA approved. And among these two, ergotroban is usually the preferred agent. We can use other heparin derivatives like fondaparinox. This is a factor 10A inhibitor. It has been used off-label in the patients with heat. Similarly, we can use the danaparoid, which is a heparinoid that comprises primarily of heparin sulfate. And this has some efficacy because it not only has anticoagulant effect, but it also inhibits the formation of PF4 heparin complex. However, this LMWH is contraindicated in heat due to high rates of uh, cross-reactivity with the heat antibodies. Similarly, warfarin should be avoided in the acute heat because it increases the risk of uh, skin necrosis. And thrombosis. However, uh, warfarin can be used for the long-term anticoagulation um, after the heat resolves. And the next group of drugs which can be used for the treatment of heat is direct oral anticoagulants. These drugs are being used off-label for the treatment of heat and the evidence is poor regarding the use of these drugs. However, uh, rivaroxaban has the most published experience. Similarly, there are studies going on regarding the apixaban and dabigatran. And the American Society of Hematology guideline has provided conditional recommendation for the use of DOAC in acute HIT in clinically stable patients who are considered average risk for bleeding. So other than this pharmacological therapy, there are some non-anticoagulant therapies like IVIG and the plasma exchange. This can be used in the life-threatening cases and in the severe cases only. However, these are not the preferred mode of treatment. These are the differences which we used in our presentation. Thank you.